Today we're going to be talking about the development and outcomes of youth with emotional disturbance. This means we're going to focus on how children develop, how during adolescence various processes come together that contribute to their outcomes, and how we as teachers and other professionals can work to use knowledge of development to enhance the outcomes of students with EBD. The term developmental pathways refers to the processes and factors that come together to influence how children adjust over time. The term youth outcomes refers to those things that we think are important that indicate how children are adjusting and how they're developing and growing and those things like finishing school, doing well in a job, those are things that we talk about when we say the word youth outcomes. Like all youth, students with EBD have the potential to be successful in school and to achieve positive long-term outcomes. This module will focus on early adolescent development and youth outcomes. Our discussion will center on why are youth with EBD vulnerable for school failure, school dropout, and poor post-secondary outcomes? How do youth with EBD achieve positive outcomes and experience educational success even though they are vulnerable for poor outcomes? And then how do we use information about youth risk and positive development to increase the likelihood of their immediate school success as well as long-term outcomes? such as passing end of year grades, high school graduation, post-secondary education attendance, and positive adulthood adjustment. The complexity of adolescent development and what predicts student outcomes. If you look at figure one, at first glance, it can look really overwhelming, but it really doesn't need to be. It's showing a dynamic system of adolescent development and it's showing different levels of factors that work together. The factors we have listed here aren't all inclusive. We could have different factors here, but these are the factors that we believe are most likely to influence the outcomes of the students you work with, and these are factors that in some way you may be able to leverage or modify in your classroom or in the experience a student has in ways that can really enhance their ability to function both in school and to achieve and have uh, positive outcomes in the future. So looking real quickly at this system, first the outer ring is the developmental ecology. And if you look at the lines between each of these factors, you'll see that there's an arrow on each end. That means that each of these factors are bi-directionally linked to each other. And that means that they influence each other. So as they contribute to the student's adjustment and outcomes, they're also contributing to each other. And that's why we say they're correlated or that they're correlated and constrain each other because as one changes, the others may change in relation to each other. So anyway, looking at the outer rim the developmental ecology we find school resources and climate family siblings community engagement and peer activities community resources and cultural factors and all of these factors combined operate together to be part of the child's overall developmental ecology then moving down to the next level we're talking about the classroom or the classroom ecology and there we have teacher practices student-teacher interactions, social structure, social dynamics, rules, norms, and peer culture, and resources. Next, let's move to student functioning and adaptation. Uh, there we find behavioral functioning and adaptation, so how the student is functioning behaviorally in the classroom, how they're adapting with regards to the behavior. Then we have their social functioning and adaptation. That's how they get along with peers and get along with adults and others as they go throughout their school day. Then we move to educational mindset and goals for the future. 
And that's how do students think about themselves as a student? How do they view themselves in the classroom? Do they feel like they belong? Do they value what they're doing academically? Do they think it matters for their future? And so that's how they overall have a sense of themselves as a student. And then finally, academic functioning and adaptation, that's all about how are they engaged in instruction, uh, how they work with regards to achieving academically, and then what is their actual achievement? How well are they doing in their academic work? So those four things come together to contribute to the student's overall functioning and adaptation in the classroom. And then at the center, we have the student's actual adjustment and outcomes. And so what this means is all of those three different levels are operating together and influencing each other, and they all come together to influence the student's adjustment and outcomes. In turn, the student's adjustment and outcomes can influence each of these factors. So that's why we talk about this being a correlated system, a system of correlated constraints where all these different factors work together to contribute to each other as they influence students' developmental pathways. Each of these factors contributes to students' long-term outcomes. More importantly, these factors work together as a system. And to understand how to intervene, we must focus on the system and how the various factors influence each other to contribute to school success, high school completion, and positive adult health. Now we're going to talk about making the complex understandable and leveraging it to support you. What that means is we're going to talk about how do we move from this dynamic systems thinking that can be complex, how do we take the information from figure one and help it to guide us with regards to what we do with students in our classroom so that they do adapt and do well both for us in our day-to-day -day activities but as they go across the school year and as they move from year to year and finally finish high school and move into adulthood. So to understand the development of adolescence and to understand how we can use knowledge about development to support students with EBD, I want to start by asking you to think about something completely different. So to make this less complex, let's think about cake. I want you to think about cake. What causes the cake? This seems like an odd question, and in some ways it is. But it's a question I've been asking teachers for over 20 years now whenever I go out and do professional development. And it's also a question that I ask students who are beginning teachers when I'm teaching classes at the university. What I'd like for you to do is to imagine that there's a cake sitting in front of you. And what are the things that have caused that cake? So I'd like for you to take out a sheet of paper and a pen or pencil and simply write down all of the things that you can think of that are the cause of the cake. You can list as many different possible causes as you can think of. Just take a little bit of time to write these causes down and complete them before you move on to the next slide. Diverse pathways to positive outcomes. These pictures of cake show us that uh, there are different types of cakes and you don't have to have the same cake to be a good cake and you can have different cakes for different occasions. When we think about students developing, sometimes we get caught in the mindset that everyone has to get there the same way and have exactly the same outcome. And part of this metaphor of what causes the cake is to help us think about diversity in different ways of getting to the same outcome or getting to a comparable outcome or to an outcome that's meaningful and good for the particular person. So some people may not like cheesecake or may not like hot fudge and ice cream, but other people may really enjoy it. And you may have cakes 
for very different reasons. And depending on the occasion, one cake may seem to be more appropriate than the, the other. So what we're really wanting to think about here is how do we have diverse pathways that fit for different diverse students? So we're back to the question of what causes the cake. When I ask teachers this, I'll get lots of different responses. Uh, we'll get responses that fit in the category of ingredients, things like eggs, flour, sugar, butter, chocolate. So things that actually go into the cake and part of the cake. But we'll also get uh, answers that reflect motivation. Things like special occasion, I'm hungry, I really like dessert, and my grandmother loves me. And so the point there is that there can be different reasons for why a person is making a cake. But if someone's not motivated, it doesn't matter what the ingredients are, they may never come off the shelf because no one really wants cake. So one of the things that causes the cake is that someone was motivated and wanted to have a cake. Then we have answers that reflect resources, things like ovens, bowls, pans, mixer, and electricity. And they're not the reason that someone was motivated to make the cake, and they're not the ingredients that go into the cake. But if you didn't have them, it doesn't matter how motivated or how many eggs and how much flour you have, it's really difficult to make a cake without an oven or without bowls to mix the ingredients in or without electricity for the oven to work uh, and so on. So resources are very important as part of the causes that go into the cake. And then finally, people often talk about the cooking process. So things like using a recipe, knowing how to mix the ingredients, timing the process, decorating the cake. So these are all things that help the ingredients and the resources and the motivation come together and to be part of what causes a final product. So the point behind this metaphor is really to help you think through that many times when we think about a student's behavior, we want to focus specifically on that behavior and how we change that without thinking about what are the other factors that could be going in to influence it. So when we go back to thinking about correlated constraints, that what we're really thinking about are the different things like the ingredients, the motivation, the resources, the processes that all come together to contribute to the student's functioning and their outcome. How does the cake metaphor help us understand the outcomes of students with EBD? So why does this matter? First, we want you to think about the fact that there's not one cause. There's multiple factors working together as a system. So instead of thinking that, okay, I've got to change this one thing, and that's the important thing, Sometimes there are other factors that could be equally influential, and it may very well be that in terms of influencing the student's adjustment in the classroom, that changing different factors or changing multiple factors together may be important, more important or more impactful than changing that one thing. So not one cause multiple factors working together as a system. Second, equifinality. That means that there's multiple ways to get to positive outcomes. That just like I showed you different pictures of different cakes, that, uh, that you could get the same chocolate cake or comparable chocolate cakes by using different ingredients, using different resources, having different motivations, uh, having different overall ways of thinking about why you're creating the cake. But at the end of the day, you could get to that same outcome. 
that's something that we often forget about when we think about kids with emotional behavioral disorders. We want them to do things exactly the same way others can do it. And that may not be the best pathway for them. So instead of thinking that you have to do something a certain way, what we need to do is to figure out what's the pathway that works for this student so that we can get to the positive outcome of completing school, but how we help that student get there may look different than how we do it with most other students. And that's okay. That's exactly where we want you to be. We want you to think about in special education, we're all about individualizing, and we want you to really think about how do we create the pathway that's going to be successful for this student. Multi-determined difficulties. Problems in one domain can contribute to problems in another domain. So if you're making a cake and you don't have enough oil or enough flour or eggs, or maybe your power goes out halfway through, that those types of things can into, end up being a poor outcome. But because you have multiple factors working together, you often can do things that can accommodate or compensate or help to cope and make that problem less problematic for the overall outcome. So the idea that there are multiple, multiple things going in together to cause the cake helps us think about what happens when we have a problem in one domain, how can we make adjustments in others to compensate for it? So the possibility of adaptation. Positive factors within or across domains can make up for and prevent negative outcomes due to problems in a particular domain. And that's something we often forget about with regards to students with emotional behavioral disorders. We get so focused on the problem behavior that we may overlook strengths and realize that those strengths are the way to help us reduce the impact of the problem behavior and help us realign different factors so that the student can still get to a positive outcome. So that's what we really want you to be thinking about. Going back to that concept of equifinality, we want you to think about how can we make adaptations in that system of correlated constraints in ways that help our students make it through school, complete high school, and do positive things as they move forward into adulthood. Now we want to return to our figure one, our model of correlated constraints, talk a little bit about bidirectional processes and what that means for understanding the concept of correlated constraints. The bidirectional arrows means that each of the factors influence each other. Because they influence each other and they operate in a system, they're correlated, which means that they change in relationship to each other. But because they're all correlated together, that can make it difficult for the system to change. So bidirectional influence can support stability and constrain change. For example, let's look at the level of the student functioning and adaptation. That if a student is having problems in academic functioning and adaptation, and they have correlated problems in behavioral functioning and adaptation, and their social functioning, and their mindset and all of those things work together to constrain and keep the student having difficulties in the classroom, then it may make it really difficult to change either their academic functioning or their behavioral functioning or their social functioning. But if we can think conversely, the bidirectional influences can promote change and foster adaptation or maladaptation. So back to our example, 
that the student is doing poorly with regards to academics and you also have uh, uh, problems behaviorally, socially, and with regards to their mindsets, that to foster change in one of those factors could promote change in the others. So if you can change the child's social functioning and help them to feel good about their place in the classroom, maybe they're more likely to be engaged academically and develop stronger uh, mindsets. And maybe as they begin to do better academically, that their behavior also changes. So the point is that all of these factors operating in a system together that that they're likely not to change overall and you're likely to have the same level of functioning across time but if we can influence change in one domain and we can be selective and supportive in the other domains then we can foster realignment and reorganization of the system of factors A student in context perspective of middle school adaptation. Youth develop holistically. Their academic, behavioral, emotional, and social functioning are interdependent. There are four primary functional demands in schools. Academic achievement, self-regulation of behavior and emotions, developing social competencies and positive relations, and developing positive self-concept as a learner. Cultural and ecological factors contribute to the strengths and needs that students bring to the classroom. And students in the same class can experience the classroom climate and context in very different ways. That goes back to that concept of equifinality that uh, you can have different pathways to the same outcome, but that we can also think in terms that different students in the same context are going to have different attributes, different characteristics. They're going to view the context differently and they're going to experience it differently. So just because you're doing the same thing with every student doesn't mean that you're meeting their particular needs. And it doesn't mean that they will all have the same outcome because you're doing something exactly the same way. Instead, Reflecting that concept of equifinality, we want to think about how we're being responsive to different cultural and ecological factors that contribute to how the student is experiencing the classroom. So how youth experience the context contributes to their adaptation, their patterns of behavior, their mindsets, and their long-term outcomes. By managing the context to build on students' strengths, enhance their competencies and carefully promoting the negotiation of areas of difficulty, teachers can foster positive developmental trajectory for youth who are at risk for poor outcomes like academic failure and school dropout. So the point here is it's not just a matter of trying to figure out how to fix the kid. In fact, we would say that the focus really shouldn't be on fixing the kid, but rather on figuring out how do we change or adapt the context? How do we tailor instructional practices to the student? And how do we help this student find their pathway to success? That each and every student can be successful. And so it is incumbent on us to take the time to figure out what do they need in this context that brings out their strengths and helps them move forward on a positive trajectory. Student and context perspectives of tailored intervention. As we intervene with students, we must be aware that their opportunities, experiences, and relationships can either enhance or interfere with the impact of student-focused interventions. We must manage classroom and school context to support students' adaptation and the success of individual-focused interventions. 
This includes teachers being attuned to cultural factors and classroom social dynamics. Teacher can use their understanding of cultural and social dynamic factors to tailor the context and specific interventions to the experiences, strengths, and needs of specific students. Student functioning and the context of development in schools. Going back to, once again, our model of correlated constraints, thinking about student adjustment and outcomes as a system of factors. And here we're going to focus in on that most internal ring, the aspects of a student's school day that are most directly related to their overall adjustment and their outcomes, both in the moment and long term, down the line, all the way to completing a high school and their adjustment as adults. So thinking about this working together as a system, we have academic functioning, social functioning, behavioral functioning, and mindset and self-concept. And those four components work together as a system. And as we said, they if they change, they change in relation to each other. So what we have to think about with regards to when we think back out into that broader uh, second ring of the classroom ecology, how are all of those different factors influencing not simply one of these factors, but all of these factors working together as a system? And so that means when we're thinking about intervening and supporting students, we try to find those factors in the context that can impact this overall uh, model of the students functioning and adjustment in the classroom. So that said, it could very well be that the focus, even though the child is struggling academically, the focus may really be on helping them develop positive and supportive relationships with peers in ways that help them feel more comfortable with their academic functioning, help change that mindset, and therefore help to produce more supportive behavioral patterns. So that said, what we really want you to think about here is that you are thinking about this system of four different factors operating together to all contribute to students' adjustment and outcomes, but they're not operating, only are they not operating independently of each other, they're operating as a system embedded within that classroom context. So it's really important to think about this system of functioning in the classroom context. Managing correlated constraints to foster positive outcomes. Middle school is a time of opportunity to promote the positive realignment of problematic developmental trajectories of students who are vulnerable for dropping out. Many vulnerable youth have positive turning points that results in school completion and positive adult outcomes. This involves the four factors operating as a positive system. The goal of intervention is to create a positive system of factors that support each other. This means that as we intervene with one factor, we must be aware of and responsive to the other factors in the system. Turning points and ordinary magic. The concept of turning points for developmental realignment has been termed ordinary magic by Ann Maston. Uh, Ann is a developmental psychologist who has studied children from middle childhood across adolescence and into early adulthood. And she's found that changes in one problem factor uh, along with the development of strengths can turn around an entire system of risk. So that concept of turning points or ordinary magic simply means that a system of correlated constraints can work together and help foster the overall positive development of youth who struggled early on, either in childhood 
for early adolescence. So our point here is just because students are having emotional and behavioral difficulties as middle school students, and even though they are vulnerable and at higher risk of dropping out of school and having problems, that doesn't have to be the case. Those risks don't have to turn into long-term problems. On the contrary, there can be turning points that prevent that negative pathway. What are those turning points? Often these turning points can be tracked to a teacher who takes the time to help the student negotiate difficulties and develop positive strengths in relationships in the school context. Both Anne's Maston work that, that has shown this with about 270 kids uh, in a project they call Project Competence, but also the Carolina uh, Longitudinal Study tracked over 700 students from uh, 10 years of age to 22 years of age and found exactly the same thing. They find that there are turning points, these correlated constraints can result in problematic outcomes, but when they didn't, it was usually because there was adult in the child's life, often a teacher, maybe a coach or someone in the community, but the child developing positive, strong relationships with adults in ways that help them feel like they're supported, someone has their back, that they can do well in school, that they're on a pathway to positive outcomes, and that they can see that they can make it. So what we're really saying here is helping struggling kids develop that mindset that, yes, they too can graduate from school and have positive outcomes in adulthood. To conclude, we want you to think about next steps and what we've talked about and what this means for working with students with emotional and behavioral disorders. Uh, I have a list of modules that we'll be doing in the future. And in the next several models, we will address topics to help you identify vulnerable youth, clarify malleable factors to leverage during intervention, and tailor interventions to students and context. I'm not going to go over the specific titles of each of these modules, but rather just simply wanting to say that the real purpose of what we've talked about in today's module is to say that yes, we can predict which students are most likely to have poor outcomes, to not make it through high school, and to have adjustment problems in adulthood. And that's what the early warning system is all about. It's helping us identify those students. But we certainly can't stop there. Uh, on the contrary, while we can predict that certain students are vulnerable and are much more likely to, to drop out of school, we also can predict that these patterns can be changed and they can be changed by what happens with students in the classroom. They can be changed by being attuned to these correlated constraints, understanding how the different factors operate together. And as we intervene, we're not just trying to use the intervention in lockstep in a way that we can say, well, we implemented the intervention with fidelity, but rather we're trying to say, how are we impacting the students functioning across the academic, behavioral, and social domains, as well as their mindsets about themselves as a learner? And how are we creating a context that helps them develop and flourish and become a student who feels comfortable in the classroom, feels like they belong, doesn't have behavioral problems, doesn't have attendance problems, does well academically and has supportive relationships with classmates and adults. And when we can bring these factors together as a system, we will have the student 
on a pathway that makes it very unlikely that they'll drop out of school. So the next set of modules that we have, that this full set all comes together to help us towards that end goal of helping you help vulnerable students stay in school, develop positive self-identities, and move forward, graduate from high school, and do well as adjusted adults. Application activities. To help you bring all the concepts together that we've just talked about, I want you to think back in your lives as a middle school student and think about someone that you grew up with. Actually think about two people that you grew up with. So remembering back to when you were growing up, think of two kids you knew when you were in elementary school. It could be yourself, a classmate, a sibling, a neighbor, a cousin, you know, whoever you can think of. Each of these people should be someone who has surprised adults and or classmates in terms of their high school and or their adulthood outcomes. One person should be someone who did well in elementary school but struggled somewhere along the way and has had difficulty in adolescence or adulthood. The other person should be someone who struggled in elementary school but did well in high school or college and has had good adult outcomes. For each of these people, try to remember their experiences during middle school in terms of their relationships with school adults, peers they hung around with, their social reputations, their academic performance, their involvement in extracurricular activities, and opportunities for positive roles and responsibilities. In thinking about these students and in thinking about their experiences, can you identify turning points and developmental factors that may have contributed to the developmental pathways and outcomes? Uh, do this in a way that you're comfortable with. I know that it's sometimes, well, it's not comfortable thinking about a friend or someone that you were closely associated with uh, struggling and having problems. And it often is comfortable thinking about someone who struggled and then turns things around and, and does well. But in thinking back in your own lives that, that really our own experiences can be a very good guide for helping us understand these concepts. So we're hoping that you can think back and that this will help you think about how all of this comes together and how it may help you understand students in your classroom better. In closing, we wanted to provide you with a resource that does help bring all this together. We have an article that here, this link, you can use this link to get to an article that's open sourced, which means that you don't have to pay for it. You simply click on the link. It will get you to this article titled Supporting the Inclusion of Socially Vulnerable Early Adolescents theory and illustrations of the base model. And this is in Frontiers in Education. It's a paper that members of our team have written that focuses on bringing together all these concepts, all the different things that we talked about, correlated constraints, equifinality, developmental pathways. We describe all the theory there in more detail than we did in this this module, but then we also provide different intervention components that make up this intervention model that we call BASE. And that BASE stands for uh, Behavioral, Academic, and Social Engagement. And it's a model that goes from a correlated constraints, dynamic systems, viewpoint for intervention, and it works across those three components as well as students' mindsets and how they think about themselves and experience the context in middle school. And this is a, a model that provides 
some strategies and ways that teachers can think about tailoring interventions in the context to support students who are vulnerable for problems. So uh, this is a resource that we will go back to again and again. For right now, it's helping you think about the theories and the concepts, but we will return to it later to talk in more detail about specific interventions across the academic, the behavioral, and the social domains.